Some of you may know Dr. Daniel Osi from Deeper Life Christian uh, Church. He, when he was praying, the Lord took him up in the spirit and he saw uh, a huge angel that looks uh, uh, after Singapore. And this angel came and uh, of many prophecies that was given, the, 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 the angel in charge of Singapore appeared and said there are four types of churches in Singapore. Number one is the defiled church where evil is called good and wickedness and abomination is called righteousness. Now, it, just to make it simple, it simply says whatever you do wrong, don't worry about it, it's all okay. God is there to forgive you. So they kind of uh, 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 underline this whole thing of walking righteously with God. How many of you know when we walk righteously, there is effort and there is stress? Correct? Uh, only three, huh? let's try again. When you walk righteously, there is effort and there is stress. Why? Because we are walking and pushing against the gravity of the world. The world's gravity always pulls you. There's no way you can pray and just take off. There's always this gravity of the world that will pull you. The gravity of the flesh, the gravity of your mind, whatever you empower, whatever is strong in you will keep pulling you and fighting you for a while. It's just simply like an aircraft when it when takes off. They need to have strong combustion uh, engines to beat the power of gravity and take off. And that's what it is. Okay? So, uh, the, the, in a bottom line or in a simple way, that's what it means. There is immorality and sexual perversion from the pulpit to the pews. And I detest your actions, says the Lord. Now, immorality in, in the Bible, there are also two types. Number one is the physical level of immorality. Number two is the spiritual level of immorality. That means it's simply by saying you are married to Jesus, but you are dancing with the world. Simple way of saying it. You are married to Jesus, but you are prostituting yourself with the world. That, that's how God rebuked the children of Israel. You belong to me, yet you are prostituting with the world. So immorality can mean two ways. That, that, that is number one, the defiled church. Number two, the divided church. Where there is hidden leadership tussle. Now every leader secretly wants to outdo the other by building up groupism and alliances. I, the Lord, will shake you up as soon as to separate the wheat from the chaff if you do not repent. Now I'm sure that if you, are, uh, if you have come from if you have been in, in, in the church for a while, uh, in, 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 as you have grown up in the church for a while, you know that this is a common, not a church problem, human problem. Okay? Human problem. Yeah, the, the identity of human. So there is this uh, struggle that happens in the divided church. Who belongs to which camp? Okay? And then the third is the disgraced church. Now where there is hidden covetousness, Pride and arrogance, hunger for fake, uh, uh, fake popularity. Is that right? Yeah. Hunger for fake popularity, love for money, have taken over righteousness and truth. Repent, or I will remove your light. You have brought reproach to my name and opened the door for the Gentiles to trample on my divine attributes. Therefore, repent, repent before it is too late. Now, this is the third type of church which is the disgraced church 
where there is greed and covetousness, pride and arrogance and everything that is of the world and that is of the flesh is already inside. It is not rebuked, it is not addressed, it is condoned. It is kind of a, a butter over kaya, you know, that kind of story. It just, just be there. Don't deal with it. And that's the third type. And the fourth type of church, and of course everybody wants to say, oh, I, I, I am this church, I belong to this church. And this is what I pray, that we will belong to this church. The remnant church. Say the word remnant. The remnant church where truth and righteousness is preached and practiced but facing tremendous pressure from the satanic agents to compromise. I, the Lord, says to you, do not compromise by hold on to what you have, what you have and I will reward you. Yes, you lack size, resources, fame, popularity. You are rejected and scorned, but I say to you, hold fast to what you have till the end of your reward is with me, says the Lord. Now remember, this is not talking about, uh, sorry, this is not talking about a small church. You, you lack resource, you have fame, popularity. That means this is talking about a small church. It's not about small or big. Are you with me? It is about the spirituality of a church. You can be big and mighty, still remain as a remnant. So it's not about you lack resources. That means the rich church, rich churches are not in this group. No, don't think that way. Yeah? Everyone have their own strength and own weaknesses. But God is trying to address a spiritual issue that we need to be aware of. Now this morning, I want to share with you about the power of the blood of Christ. Okay. This is not part of what I... Uh, the, the prophecy is not what I wanted to share with you. But when we, the worship was going on, I, I, I was just remind, uh, reminded about the prophecy of the types of churches or can we say the four types of churches can also mean about the four types of believers that can be found in the body of Christ the divided the compromised the defiled and the remnant or the holy those who are pushing themselves to live for the Lord now there's going to be stress there's going to be challenge. And all of us, there's no way you can be holy or overcomer without temptation. Now, temptation comes in the different degrees regardless of your level of spirituality. Why? Because if there's no temptation at that level, then there is nothing to overcome at that level. Correct? Now, there is a level in Christ where we will be beyond that point of satanic troubles where the troubles will come from within fame pride that we have to fight ourselves against i'm not going that way i'm just talking about the basic areas all of us have to overcome as we are living for the lord in these days the more a country is becoming affluent and blessed richly in fact one of the recent survey it's a shocking survey in Singapore per capita, okay, per capita in Singapore, we have one of the highest number of millionaires in this nation compared to the world, per capita. Southeast Asia, no need to compare. This is still the highest. One of the reasons, probably the other millionaires from different countries are coming here and they are becoming PR or citizens, so we are importing many millionaires. So the affluence is also reaching up. People's lifestyle, standards, and all of that is coming. Tomorrow night, I'll be sharing with you the urban spirituality, which the Lord placed in my heart. We are growing in urban, so we, we can't pretend as though we are in the kampong. We can't pretend as though there are no handphones and no Wi-Fi. One of the biggest demons, our stronghold, uh, 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 it's no longer Satan, it's, it's a Wi-Fi. It's the spirit world called the Wi-Fi world. <laughs> Even that f world, nobody knows where, you know. Everywhere, it's, it's just working and it's connected. Okay? So tomorrow, I'm going to share with you, in the midst of all these challenges, how can I still be what God wants me to be? How can I still exercise my choices? But tonight, uh, this morning rather, 
for Sunday service. I want to share with you this H.O. sermon which you don't get to really hear anymore. Hello? Do you remember the Sunday school? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Then, continue. Ah, uh, uh, yes. There is power, power, wonder-working power. We roughly know your age group already. <laughs> wonder-working. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Now, either you used to sing this song in Sunday school or only in Crusades. Because the devil hates this song. And the devil gets stirred up with this song. And the Bible is true when the Bible says that the devil fears and trembles God, but the saints do not. The sins in us, the hidden demons within us, do not tremble. Because we know we are assured, well, there is forgiveness, but don't worry. But the truth being, my brothers and sisters, we cannot live holy without the blood of Christ. We can't. Absolutely not possible. In the midst of all our acknowledgement, I think the stress has become on our spirituality, on our prayer, on our level of worship, on how much you know the Bible, how holy you are, how, how defensive you are in pushing away of uh, uh, temptation. Uh, see a woman walking immediately close eyes. Don't care whether it's mother or grandmother. You know. no, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's not about this external resistance. In the midst of all this, the power of the blood of Jesus. The reliance on the power of the blood of Jesus. The dependency, even when you are flowing in the anointing, flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, and for those of you who can prophesy, when you are prophesying suddenly, something that you have not forgiven someone comes up into your mind, you know. If you have not forgiven, you are prophesying to another person. Forgive. The Lord say forgive. Hey, the Lord say forgive. Forgive to you, to you as well. And immediately you are remembered of someone that you have not forgiven. All that you get is say, Lord Jesus, cleanse my mind. Through the blood of Jesus, forgive me. Bang. And continue ministering. Hello? Because the power of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus makes a sinner to be a saint in seconds. Unbelievable. You mean you are forgiven? Huh? You do everything, you are forgiven? Yes, absolutely. That's the blood of Jesus. Amen. I want to bring you back into this thought, into our reliance, absolute dependence on what Jesus has done on the cross for us. The blood of Jesus is not only what Jesus has done for you and me, forgiving us and cleansing us. It is the power of the blood of Jesus that gives you this this uh, supernatural covering where the devil has got no power to touch you. Thank you for nobody saying amen. You say amen lah. For what pastor? No, because pastor said lah. <laughs> the power of the blood of Jesus is like a hidden shield all around you and something which God doesn't brag about. Hello? He doesn't brag about this. You know, when God does things in your life, He doesn't brag about it. He, he's quietly... He do, he do things quietly and He walks away until you acknowledge that and in worship you give Him the glory. You acknowledge it. You discover, hey, how come this thing is happening all the time even I, I'm not praying? Oh, it's God. And you acknowledge that. God placed people in you and God placed certain words in your life and more than that, it's the power of the blood of Jesus. The power of the blood brings you close to the throne and a couple of things that we're going to talk about bring you back into the dependency on the blood of Jesus. The moment the blood of Jesus is applied on you and me, no demons can touch you. No demons can even think about you. You are covered and you are sheltered in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has this power imminent to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even when you don't forgive yet, God has already forgiven you. And that's something we find it difficult to believe. 
We say, God, forgive me. I've done this a thousand times. And again, I come and ask for your forgiveness. Immediately, the Lord forgives you. And we find it difficult to believe in that level and the power of God's love for us because of the blood of Jesus. Demons fear this name. That is why in almost every evangelistic rally, this song is being sung. The moment you say, there's power in the blood, those who are demon-possessed will start screaming. So easy, no? No need to stir anything. Just sing this song, easy song, first song. And the demons will start. When they are dancing, don't think it's a charismatic dance. It's a demonic dance. <laughs> You've got to go and find out which is which and, and, and kick these things out. Power of the blood of Jesus. In the midst of all the subjects that we are hearing in the modern church, in the modern city, as we becoming very complex and deep and all the things we are growing, I think we lack the basics of our faith with God. Power in the blood of Jesus. So I want to bring you back into this thought, into a little Bible study. For the next uh, a couple of Sundays with you, to bring you back into the basics of what God said. Now, till today, now I studied this subject more intently, more than 20, more than 20 years ago, very intently. But till today, my prayer when I come before God, every day, cover me with the blood of Jesus. And one of the things that I've taught our team as we go out, and when we go for spiritual warfare and missions, before we engage, cover our families with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus releases heaven's arsenal on our lives and our family. Even before you naming one by one, you just say, Lord, cover us with the blood of Jesus. Bang! Everything comes. I shared with you before many for many of you, so I want to share the little testimony. Funny though it can be, my first experience of the blood of Jesus. I was 16 years old. When I started to conduct a prayer meeting, I conducted a prayer meeting. Actually, it was not really a conducting a prayer meeting. I started to pray, people started to join. Simple as that. Okay? And then eventually, from one person, it became 30 people by the end of the week. Many people were delivered, I don't know how. I was just praying and praying and praying. So I was praying in this particular friend's house when their children were screaming and crying. And the second daughter, she screamed and cried that she could see a demon holding her behind from worshipping the Lord. We don't realize that when we are worshipping, when your mind is overly distracted, demons are actively strangling your spiritual flow from engaging in God. We don't realize. That is why we keep telling our young people, when your mind is fully active, you don't realize the demons are also playing an important role in empowering unless you pull your mind and say, surrender yourself to God, now is God's time. Amen? Because in this God's time, when you allow God to intermittently speak into your heart and speak into your mind, He will help you to deliver yourself from those things which are not from God. The reality will come. If not, you can be in church yet not delivered. Spiritually, am I delivered? Yes. Am I experiencing the deliverance? No. So there is a disconnect from heaven to earth, from God to me. We are worshipping yet for the person who's not connected, they are singing songs. They are not worshipping. Are you with me? And so this, uh, now remember I was 16 and this girl was about uh, 12 or 13. All three of us were praying. The other girl was uh, the, the elder sister. She was probably about 14. So this girl was about 11 or 12. We were praying. Now I didn't know what to do when she said there's uh, this uh, demon that was holding in. You see, a uh, Small girl like that won't be lying, you know. It's, it's very frightening and she was crying away when she said that. I'm trying to worship but there is a demon that came and pulled me down. So I asked her to describe how this demon looked like. She said it looked like a very old woman, a black figure but could see a, a wrinkles and very old woman with a big, large a plastic bag and she was uh, 
holding it on her shoulder and weighing her down. So I didn't know what to do. So I remembered what the Bible said. You shall lay hands on people and the demons will run. So I lay hands on, the, on her. So I can't remember the scripture. Lay hands. And in Je- I don't know how to c- command the demons to go. So I only say, in Jesus' name, all the demons have to leave. Or whatever that is. La. Old woman. So I describe la, back. La, whatever plastic bag you're taking. Oh, you know, name as much as possible. You know. Then I, I figure out the house was closed. You know, the door was closed. The windows was closed. The fan was on. How this demon is going to go out? Can I? I, oh, Jalan, I'm praying, praying, praying. Window, everything is closed. I was looking around. I quickly run while I was praying. I quickly opened the window so the demons will go. So I came back to pray. And, and this girl is screaming, you know. And the other girl didn't even dare to open her eyes. And I didn't know what was going on. Uh, what, what time was it? 11.30 in the night. The mother cannot, <laughs> she just went to sleep. See, you all want to pray your prayer, your young people, are, you know. So we were praying, the window is now open. I continue praying, I say, finish lah. If the demon can jump out, the demon can come in, right? The window is open, what? <laughs> so I, I said, I said, oh, remember the blood of Jesus. So Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, as this demon is going to go out, uh, may not be the exact words what I'm saying now, but that was my uh, uh, words or the intention of what I said exactly. As these demons went out, I, I place a line of the blood of Jesus across the window. And I, while I was praying, I went to the, near the window and I did this. I, I draw a line across this window that these demons will not jump back. I finished like, saying whatever that I was saying, finish. And then about half an hour, this girl fainted. The young girl I was praying for, fainted. And I also have no breath, tired, <laughs> stop. Thank you, Jesus. And then finish it. She woke up about 10 minutes later. Hey, can you describe what happened? She said, while I prayed for her, this demon came out, took, opened the back and put a lot of things inside. And like an old woman with a heavy bag she was you know crunching forward and she carried this heavy bag and she went to the window and that spirit jumped out of the window and the moment the spirit jumped out i saw a red line suddenly appearing all across the window and the demon was standing outside and couldn't come in oh, i said thank you lord <laughs> oh, so thank you. so encouraged exactly as she prayed and it happened but that was my first experience of what the blood of Jesus can do. And that is why we have automatic renewal of God's protection even when you forget to pray. Even when you walk ag- against God in disobedience, rebellious or sin. The basic protection of God is all the time with you because of the covenant of the blood of Jesus over our life. But God warns his people if you continue walking in sin you are trampling my blood on your feet and walking against it so if you honor me you got to walk with me the power of the blood of jesus now we can talk about many many things but the first and the foremost thing i want to encourage all of us is this okay yeah oops sorry technical again I'm using a new technology today. Okay, throne of God, be there. Be there. Oops. Am I? Okay, please let us solve this problem for me. I don't know why. why. Okay, the throne of God. Listen, Ephesians 2.13 is my favorite scripture. But now in Christ Jesus, you are once far away. Say the word far away. So no longer from today, from this morning, no longer confess that you are far away from God. Don't ever say that anymore. God says you were once far off, but you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Say the word brought near. Now another scripture which we are not going to talk about this morning, it says you are brought near to the throne of grace. 
Let us have this confidence in the book of Hebrews it says. Let us have this confidence that you are not far off. You know, you are brought near to the throne of grace. How? Through the blood of Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus. I've been brought near. So when I'm worshipping God, I'm already right in front with the Lord Jesus. Yet my spiritual perceptions help is making me feel I'm far off. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have you heard the phrase, you are near yet you are not here? Have you ever said that to your loved one? You are in the home, you are in the house, yet you are so far off. Our hearts are not connected, we are so far. Yet you are just beside, you know. Are you with me? Hey, don't start crying, later we pray for you. <laughs> but you understand what I'm trying to say. If you understand, say yes. yes. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You can be Surrounded by the Bible and Christian books, yet you don't read. You know how to pray, yet you don't pray. You know, I should pray, but I don't pray. I should acknowledge God, but, oh yeah, thank you Lord, and you stop. Because some, something, somehow, keeps on cutting off your line with God. You dial the phone, hello, something else comes. You put down the phone, instead of putting the other phone down. Are you listening? Because somehow God has taken a secondary role in our life and that shows through our actions. We don't dare to say, boss, wait, but we dare to say, God, we'll see later. Does God mind? Most of the time He doesn't because He hopes and He knows that you're supposed to come back to Him when you say, God, wait. But we forget. Why? In our heart, Satan blocks it. To keep God in the last priority. But you know what the Bible says? I'm here when I'm praying. I'm brought to the throne of God. No devil can touch me there. Say no devil. No devil. Say no devil. No. Say no devil in a way that is no devil. Because <laughs> some of you, the way you say, oh, some devil, lah, maybe. Lah. No, no, there's no devil. That is why when you pray, no devil can hear you. Good place to say a good amen. Because everybody is frightened. When I'm praying, does the devil know what I'm praying? Let him know, la, so what? You say, secret. Ah? Let the devil know what you're praying, la, what, so what? Say to your neighbor, so what? <laughs> I don't know why people get so freaky about such things, you know. Oh, what if the devil know? Let the devil know. La. The devil should be taking note, what? <laughs> this one you're going to do. Oh, oh, the fellow going to save souls. Oh, he's anointed someone. Take note. <laughs> Take note. Tell the devil, take note. <laughs> hey, I say tell the devil, no. You're telling to me, ah, take note. <laughs> Don't be frightened because you are protected by the blood of Jesus. You see, my brothers and sisters, we cannot be talking about the anointing. We cannot be talking about spiritual warfare. We cannot be talking about prosperity if you don't know who you are and how much you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Without knowing this, you can have your millions robbed by the devil. You can have your health stolen by the devil. You can have all the authority yet you don't have guts to move in in the anointing. Tell your neighbor, you don't like the anointing. Don't like the anointing. Hey, got neighbor or not? <laughs> tell your neighbor, you don't like the anointing. <laughs> and now tell the neighbor, you lack guts. Hey, that, that's the truth, you know. Because we keep on praying for more anointing, for more anointing, for more, for what? Why? Use what you have and what you need to, uh, uh, what you need to use, th what you have, you need guts. That is why God told Joshua, be of good courage. I don't need to give you more assurance, more soldiers, no. Whatever you have now, be of good courage and fight. I will empower you. What happens when I'm, I am praying and the anointing is finishing? How? God will pour more. Don't worry. I only pray one day. No, don't worry. When you are there, if you are ministering your heart out, if you are saying, God, use me, He will pour all the entire bucket of from heaven and keep pouring until you go so overflowing. Because He looks at your heart, not how long you pray. Are you with me or not? We like guts. We, we like this 
faith and this confidence in this basic scripture, you are brought near to the throne. Because the devil will whisper, Oh, you are not close. You are far off. God, you, you, you can speak. Lah. God is so far, can't even hear. No, no, no. He hears clearly, but we can't discern that he's listening to me. You are near to God, yet you are far off. And the Bible tells us, even though that's not our subject uh, this morning, you are far off because your sin is blocking me from you. Your disobedience is blocking me from you. We do a search before God. And you know what kind of search we do? We go turbo mode, quick search. <laughs> quick, Lord, do quick one, quick. <laughs> the Lord says, be still and know. Don't do quick search. <laughs> In the, our computers, you got either quick search or slow search. Slow search means thorough search. And we like quick search because we are Singaporean. <laughs> Come, do very quick one, Lord. As I'm moving, uh, you just tell me what's wrong. We want to do quick search with God and say, God, quickly I will repent. Quickly I will obey. <laughs> Listen, your heart, your spirit is a delicate issue in heaven. Jesus died for it. And if there is sin and whatever thing is strong enough, those quick searches are not going to help you. It's going to time away be brought open before God. We cannot take the city, we cannot touch one soul. No one, if we don't know that we are brought near through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Don't let the devil fool you. Now you say, oh, these are for the, uh, 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 for the older Christians. No, no, no. The moment you are a child of God, the DNA of Jesus is already in you. You see, the moment a baby is born, no. The moment the baby is formed, the DNA of the parents is already inside. Yes or no? So let's not think what everything God says may not be true. No, if this can be true in human creation, how much of God? At least uh, for, for human creation, husband and wife, at least you know one truth, that the blood that the baby has came from the mother. The blood infusion is taking that way. That's how the blood is going, correct or not? But where did Adam, Adam get his blood from? The Bible only says that he was created out of mud. Correct or not? Mud. The outward figure. But of course God doesn't need to know or take a spinster. Ah, that one kidney yeah, put inside. Ah, ah, this one the spleen put inside. Ah, angel, ah, ah, measure the intestine how long? Ah, wait, ah. ah chocho inside. <laughs> no, no, no. God, God is like that. The moment he said, let there be light, everything, every other composite of light came into being. So when, when God created man out of the red mud, everything that is inside automatically created itself. And including the blood which Jesus had before he was even born, the pre-incarnate of Christ. Hello, are you following? Everything of him, he was making the like image. So the blood of Christ inside his body went into Adam. The life that Jesus carried, that God had, was imparted. And the last part of the whole story was the breath of life. It was breathed into him. Bang! Everything came into being. Wow! And so when I received Jesus, everything the way God made me is restored back to me. Not that now, okay, now uh, oh, you accepted Christ, huh? now come, come. I give everything back to you. No, no. He didn't give everything back to you. It was all the time in you. You have opened your eyes in the spirit. And now you have realized. God created me. I'm brought near by the blood of the Lamb. And this is the most powerful thing you have to know. Not how powerful the demon is when we are ministering to people, you know. Hello? Hello? Oh, this one is a strong demon. Uh, bring a stronger Christian. Come, come, you go and pray. No, listen. The devil at that moment can knock you out by demonstrating all this way. And you are small size standing there. But you are big in Jesus. And you got to keep this in mind. There was this story about this uh, pastor who was praying for a woman who was 
very demon possessed and she was uh, demon possessed in a very higher degree in the midst of this deliverance uh, time this demon spoke out jesus fasted hey, no no the demon said you did not fast for 40 days before casting me out i will only go out by prayer and fasting so the pastor didn't fast lah and he was knocked out for a moment, you know. He didn't know what to do because the devil confuses you by your personal shortcomings all at that moment when you are ministering to people. The wisdom of God came on him and he said, I did not fast today, but the name I'm using has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. In that name, I cast you out. And the demon screamed and ran and there was a great deliverance in that household. Amen. Oh, it all gets you back to your faith and your knowledge of God's Word. One of the reasons why I, I love studying God's Word, because in studying, I'm transformed. I'm learning. I'm changing. When we are walking and living for God, it's not all the time of giving up. Listen, giving up is very difficult for anyone. It's not just about giving up. It's very interesting, you know. Before knowing Christ, when you come to God, you give up all your sins, right? And after you are serving God, you give up all the things you do for God. <laughs> all the good things also you must learn because it's about surrender. So when we are with Christ, it's not about giving up. It's about giving in, allowing Christ to come in. Allowing Jesus to come in. That is surrender. Asking Him to come in more and more in my life give in to christ the word give in means i'm welcoming him so it makes it easier than i have to give up this i have to give up that i have to give up this because when jesus comes in he will help us to remove all darkness out of our lives amen and that's the power we need to walk we, we heard about the prof, uh, pro, uh, visions and the prophecies of the anointing of a horse and, and, and the anointing of this, the anointing of that. All that will not be effective if we don't know who we are in Christ Jesus. The other day I had the privilege of uh, meeting a, a schoolmate. Uh, four of us we met, two of them are backslidden. One guy goes to one of the big churches and uh, we have not met for 30 years and we met. And, you know, I, I look like the oldest among them with all the white hair. <coughs> and uh, just one component of that conversation that we had, a friend of mine, was st he was still struggling with a very heavy drinking uh, and, and uh, alcoholism and, and smoking. So he, he, I said, you are going to church, you are in the ministry somewhere in that church. So what did the pastoral staff do? They say, don't, you know, don't confess that you are addicted and uh, try to give up. Even if you can't give up, continue to believe Jesus has forgiven you. And before you s smoke it out, you just have, to say, uh, just have to say that he that is in me is greater than he that is uh, in the world. And then you start smoking. <laughs> wow. I, I told him that must be a powerful smoker. You know? <laughs> know. I say, okay, the theory is good because that's a way to encourage yourself. So how much, have, how much less are you smoking? Nothing has changed. He's still smoking the same way. Just that he feels that every time you smoke, God has forgiven. Every time I smoke, and I say, yeah, all that is good. You're, you're still going to heaven, but with a cancer body. So there is this balance, delicate, between teaching us of forgiveness, removing the guilt, yet not saying strong enough to push ourselves to walk with the fear of the Lord. Are you with me? The moment you say you've got to give up, we feel, oh, these guys are all like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Point to me, you know, you're not sinning. And then we, we take the legalism defense role because we find it difficult. Why must I give up? Why must I give in? And then we go through, oh, well, well, Jesus will still forgive me. What? You think God won't forgive me? So we go through this rebellious action. But what we don't realize, we are losing in the, in the grace which is in store for a victorious life. I had the same struggle. By 14 and 15, I was smoking so much, my hands will shiver. If by 8 o'clock in the morning, if I don't smoke. I'll smoke quite heavily before even going to class at 7.30 in the morning. 
I tried all my best. Jesus says, smoke. Jesus says, don't smoke. Smoke, don't smoke, smoke, smoke. Lord, help me, which one? Hey, oh, smoke, oh, one, g- one stick. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and then one stick is not one stick a day, it's one stick every time I want. Somehow, my hand dropped into the point where Jesus wants me to smoke. Okay, la. You, you ask me, I do. La. <laughs> I struggle. I, I try not smoking. And some angel will go, <laughs> go run back. <laughs> you tried. And then all the guys on that day will come and offer you, you want to smoke? Uh? You don't want to make today. I will not smoke. Today, I will overcome. And someone say, want to smoke? Ah? Oh, endless time of trying to live for the Lord. And yet being defeated all the time. In 1985, September 27, at 8 p.m., when Jesus came into my heart, when He came, He just removed everything. I don't know how to explain that. No desire to smoke, no desire for any, anything of God. The world, bang, it just left me. The Spirit of God came. I thought, wow, now I'm so strong, I can overcome. Then I saw the blood of Jesus. Oh, I need this blood. I need this blood. I need this blood. Oh, the external things are easy to give up. You know why people are watching, right? You're Christian. Oh, but the sins which are hidden inside which no one can see, the lust of the flesh, the lust of this, and the lust of that, and the lust of this, and the lust of that. No one is watching. You can still cover inside and feed that baby growing inside within you. But God is watching. I need the blood of Jesus. We can be externally a Christian, but inside our heart, if we are not a child of God, you'll be afar of when the worship is going. When the prayer is going, you can't pray. When the Bible is being taught, you can't just grab, because inside we are far away. So this morning, I want to tell you that God has set you free. He has stripped this out of our system. A very quick uh, Pointers for you to just rem- remind a little bit of history, but in the midst of all that, the Lord showed me this morning something that I've not seen for 30 over years. So I'm just going to share with you. For those of us who are very new to the blood of Jesus type of teaching or subject, where this blood of Jesus started, or where the blood started, the theory about covering and the blood started with Adam and Eve in the Eden. Genesis 3.21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Years ago, I remember when I was sharing about this, someone stood up and said, Garments of skin. What brand? Because skin what? I said, hello. God didn't go to the shopping mall to buy what brand. You know, he has to basically skin an animal and cover Adam and Eve who was naked. Remember that? Do you remember? See, when the moment God is skinning an animal, means then they are covered with the blood. That's what I wanted to think about for a moment. They are covered with the blood. Because the blood is the only covering for sin. The blood is the only covering for your uh, uh, your, uh, shame and nakedness. That is why when people live a sinful lifestyle, they feel very naked and very shameful to come to the presence of God. When people are living a sinful and a shameful lifestyle, they feel very difficult to come into a church because they feel, oh, these are holy people. I'm unholy. And some people, when they are living in sin, known sin, they are even afraid to speak to a man of God, a woman of God. They are afraid to see a prophet because they can see their presence bring them the conviction of their nakedness. Have you seen those types of people when you are praying? I don't want to Hey, I, I'm living in sin. I've got no place in a holy church. But they forgot that the church is the place for sinners to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? So my brothers and sisters, listen. If you're struggling in anything, don't let your sin keep you away from the house of God. Because in the house of God is the fountain of the blood of Jesus. It's where the fountain is. 
When we are worshipping, when someone is talking about God, that fountain keeps us cleansed and washes us. The word of God sanctifies our mind from unholiness. Worship releases the blood of Jesus on us and sanctify us. Adam and Eve needed that. And then we thought, wow, the story finishes there because there's only one guy. Later on, Noah came. Remember the Bible says there was a lot of sin in all of the land and God has to flood the earth. And then Noah came. And after Noah came out, the end of the flood, Genesis 8, 20 to 22, please don't try to squeeze your eyes and read there. Just take note, go home and read. Easy, huh? Okay. <laughs> now Genesis 8, uh, I have to squeeze my eyes also, lah. very small. <laughs> then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of, every, some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and listen, offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now I want to ask you a very important question. Somehow, the teaching of the blood of Christ or blood of God, the blood sacrifice from Adam and Eve was passed down generation after generation. That when you have sinned against God, you need to have a blood sacrifice before God and your blood, your, your sins will be washed away and God will receive you. That thing was passed down. Noah, how come Noah knew? The story was passed down. God told Noah. God told Noah to do everything. God said, you've got to make a sacrifice. And the Bible says the moment he did that, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Oh, yo. You mean God comes and smells? Uh? Yes. What does he smell now? Our worship. Our prayer. That comes from a life that is living for God. A life of obedience that's living for God. You mean 100% can uh? At least 80, 20 is good. 70, 30 is still good. 60, 40 is still good. 50, 50 is not too bad. The moment your scale keeps going down, then you will start struggling up again. Are you with me? Noah did the same thing. He has to create sacrifices. Oops. Did you see that? Oh, am I? Okay. This is where I'm, I don't know what's happening in technology. Let's turn to... Genesis chapter 8. Now, after the flood, when Noah created the sacrifice, now this is what God told him, and the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of men. For the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, coal and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And these are the seven pointers the Lord showed me this morning. Which I have not seen it before. The blood of Jesus... Number one, has removed curses out of our life. You see, the Lord says, I will never curse this ground again. Hello, somebody, um, say, some say, amen. amen. God has removed every curse away from you. No matter what your great-grandfather did, who he was, what curses that was in the family, all that is coming down, it has been broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, for some people, they were not too involved. So that curse, though it was there, broken, but they don't feel the effect. But some people are very involved. And so for those people who feel the effects of that curse being broken, we need to minister to them in a separate way. Amen? Uh, we need to pray over them, help them to renounce. Why? Everyone goes to the uh, different religious group and, uh, uh, and they pray because they are... They belong to that religion or so on and so forth. But not everyone has made a covenant with different gods or different spirits. There are some who made covenants. And because of those, some who made the covenants, those some needs to go through a process of renouncing or being broken. Okay, this is the balance between this truth that I need to tell you. Remove curses. Number two, God says, I will come and cleanse 
this place. So I have, uh, you see, the intentions of man's heart is evil. So number two, the blood of Jesus cleanses all the hearts. And you may think, why are we studying these basic things? Because our faith is anchored in the basic foundations of God's word. When people are struggling, don't, don't give them the, the 75 ways of coming to heaven. In the midst of halfway, they will die. <laughs> so difficult. Huh? Just bring one, two scriptures and share simply. See, the scripture is here. Number one, he removes curses. Number two, he cleanses your hearts. Number three, he brings life. You see, it says now, uh, seed time and harvest. Those are life things. See what happens now. Number four. Number five and number six. Oh? Hello? Up here. It does. It listens. It works. Seed time and harvest speaks of blessings and prosperity. When the blood of Jesus is upon your life, you are a candidate for God's blessings to come upon you. Amen? Say the word candidate. When will God do a miracle? God will do a miracle the moment you have a need. Somebody say amen. amen. Because we struggle. Will God do a miracle for me? This one doesn't seem like big enough. Any moment you have a need, God will do a miracle. Now how come God doesn't do for them? Maybe their heart is not pure. Because the Bible says, if you are pure in heart, you will see God in every moment, in every action, in what you are doing. God wants to build purity in our hearts and in our prayer. Purity. He will bring blessings and prosperity. I, I like really number five. The Bible says, look at, the scripture says here, <clears throat> seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. So there is a life and balance in you. God has given to you life, but there is also a sense of balance. You will know how to do how much and how not to do too much. There is a balance in your life. As much as you are being tested, you are being blessed. As much as there is sorrow and there are tears, there is so much of joy replacing that sorrow. There is a little time, the Bible says, there is a time to cry and there is a time to laugh. There is a time of everything because God brings your life back into a balanced scale. Are you with me? I like a scripture in the, in, the, in the book of Zechariah. I'm not going to talk about it. But there is a word called prisoners of hope. God has made us prisoners of hope. Oh, I tell you, tears came down from my eyes when I read the verse. Oh, God has made us prisoners of hope. We have been prisoners of many things. But God is telling today, from now you are my prisoner, the prisoner of hope. Don't be a prisoner of anything, but be a prisoner of hope. Have this hope in you that God will recover you. God will bless you. God will lift you up. Don't be afraid of what the problems are coming. Look out, for in the midst of all the problems, the mighty hand of God will come and lift you up. Don't pray for the devil to change because the devil is not going to change. Don't tell the devil, let me go. He will let you go for a while and come again with eight of his friends. <laughs> the Bible says that. But no matter how many times he comes or which army he comes, the Bible says the ones who are with you are more in number than the ones with the devil. Amen? You can say, but you are a lone person. What can you do? The Bible says, he that is in you is greater than he that is in this world. I heard a testimony from a very seasoned man of God from America. When he went to college, he was bullied by all the, uh, the, the older students. And this guy, in, 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 even in India, they have, they call ragging. Uh, I don't know, in Singapore, have uh, only Amila. They call it Hell Week. Not Hallow Week. First week in Ami. And uh, for all those who are going to the army, God bless you. It's called, the <laughs> it's called the hell week. They give you hell. Basically, that's what it means. You know, pumping potion down, sitting potion down, star jam, star jam. Don't know for what reason you are doing. Everybody asking you to buy tea, buy coffee. And you are running, you are walking, you are flying. It's called hell week. Readjusting. Everybody who's promoted, sabo you maximum because they cannot takan, they takan you back. <laughs> that's the theory. It's called hell week. 
So this guy went to the uh, college and the seniors came and threatened him to punch his face and challenge him one to one to fight. If you can win me, then you can be living peaceful for the next four years. This guy was so broken, he went and told his elder brother who was a gangster in town and everybody knows it. But these guys, the seniors in the college, don't know who this fellow's brother was. He told his brother and the brother just said, eh, and he walked away because he didn't bother what he was saying. He said, brother, you need to come tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. They are going to meet me in the porch. Please help me. The elder brother didn't say anything. He just walked away. The whole night this fellow didn't, didn't sleep. He thought next morning definitely he's going to be embarrassed in front of the girls. That means the entire year he's going to be ragged by these fellows. Next morning came the whole college and whoever was coming in, they, they were all watching what's going to happen. And right as the door opened, this gang was waiting there and the recess time came. And they were all going to the next building. When, the, uh, when he came out from the stairs, he was talking. He was all ready for a fight. He put down his bag. It was all getting ready because no way he got to run. He got to fight. As he was getting ready for a fight, the other guy just came and said, It's okay. We just disturbed you. We will not touch you anymore. You can do what you like. This school is like yours. In fact, you can tell us what to do. We will do for you also. This fellow was ready for a fight. He said, what's happening? Huh? You mean I just win? Huh? And then he, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll see about You know, he showed the attitude. <laughs> and as everybody gave the fright look and he's walking, he just went down to pick up the bag. He saw his elder brother standing behind. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> So they were not frightened for this new boy who has to try. They were frightened for the elder brother who was standing behind. They could suddenly see this fellow came in without telling the younger brother. And listen, and that's what God does for our lives. He will not tell you when he's coming, but he's there for us all the time. He will show up all the time. He will come even before you call upon his name. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Some of us are thinking that we are so protected, we are holy now because the angels are all the time with us. The blood of Christ is all the time with us. He gives us a space to repent. Even when we are walking in sin, God's love is reaching out to us. And that is why no demons will touch and some people who are walking in rebellion, I don't come to church but I'm saying, okay, why? It's because of God's love looking after you. And we take it for granted. It is my, I, I'm, I, I don't go to church, but I don't go here. I don't do evil. I'm still good. No, no, no. Self-righteousness goes nowhere. And so God wants to remind us. It's the blood of Jesus. So I saw this life balance. That is balance that God will bring back into our lives when the blood of Jesus is operating. That is longevity. The Bible says there is coal, there is heat, there is hammer, uh, summer, hammer, blah. Summer and <laughs> summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. There is longevity. When it longevity means you will not die early. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. You will die when the time comes. Don't be afraid. Oh, siliaula. No, no, no. All your siliaula doesn't work. <laughs> when God says holiaula, then it does. <laughs> Uh, then it works. Uh, Holy Amis means it's done. Uh, now you go. Now it's done. You know, no sickness can touch the righteous. This is the faith you must be anchored upon. The blood of Jesus brings about balance in your life. Sometimes you go through a problem and you say, God, I need a break. You understand? Bang! Miracles happen. Windows open for a moment. You have not passed through the test yet, but it's giving you a break. A window opens. He creates some balance in you because He knows that we cannot be tested more than what we can. So He opens a window in the midst of all those testing. The Bible says you will not be tested beyond what you can endure, remember? Well, most of us don't even want to endure even one sin. <laughs> can escape, find the root. 
So God will not allow. He strengthens us. But if you say, God, do you know I need a break? He opens a window. Because that is a balance. That is the longevity. And listen, the Bible says here, it says there is, very, there is cold and there is heat, there is summer, there is winter, there is day and night. It shall not cease. That means there is eternity when the blood of Jesus is upon your life. Amen. Never seen that for all these years. I've preached so many times. In these few words, there are seven truths hidden. And it was revealed to Noah during those point of time. When the blood of Jesus, when you make a sacrifice... No wonder, you know what the book of Job? Job was placed, is placed before Abraham. The book of Job takes place before Abraham. Chronologically, that's how they create the datings. Now how did, listen, how did Moses know Job was there? How did Moses know, cut the animal, do this, do that? God brought him inside for 40 days. Huh? Quick review of like, 3,000 years of history. Quick review, write down. Noah was there. Job was there. This fellow was praying every day. And then you cut the animal. You do this, you do that, you cook. Wow, he wrote a cookery book. <laughs> how to cook, Moses. <laughs> oh, all kinds of how to bank, doing banking. La, how to run a country. La, how, to, how to forgive your neighbor and how not to. Wow, all kinds of stuff, you know. 40 days. Day and night. Can you imagine if you are inside... MP3 recorder, bowl, yow, lay, right down now. After finishing everything Moses had to remember, God said, now I shall give you only 10 commandments. What? <laughs> you tell so much, now only concise to 10. How many do? Even though it's so holy as it is, it's comical that the way he would have gone through. That's how we know in the Bible that Job existed. And you know what Job did? The Bible says, he gave sacrifices for his children early in the morning, every day, just in case if the children would have sinned against God. Look at how parents' duty is to pray for our children every day. That we don't know what the temptations our children are going through or they may go through. They are finding their positions of testimony again. They will do the same tricks that we did. Try to say yes and do something else. And so we go before God and lay a sacrifice of worship and say, God, no matter what they are going through, cover them through the blood of Jesus. Be merciful unto them. And that's what parents are supposed to be doing. And then we thought, oh, finish. Noah had done it. Maybe Abraham escaped. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of our RA21 lesson now. Are you ready? Come on, RA sugar. Let's go. Everything else seems a little bit boring. Abraham's circumcision in Genesis 17, 11. The Bible says, God told him, you are to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between you and me. Uh, I don't know whether I put the scripture here. Maybe uh, later I'll show. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's later. You are to undergo circumcision. They never knew or never thought it was important. But now God says, circumcision is a covenant. That you have to do, you must do, it's not a choice. Because it's blood sacrifice. Instead of all the time sacrificing an animal, poor animal. Eh? Every time you do a sin, you commit. Now, once and for all, be a covenanted person with me. No wonder he's looking like that. Oh, oh die la. See, look at the photo. You must be circumcised. Oh, die la. You know? And then we thought it's finished. And then we go to Isaac. Genesis 22, 2. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice on one of those mountains which I shall tell you. And you know the story later that God himself provided for a ram. Amen? Now that was again a blood sacrifice. I'm just taking a few more scriptures here to show you the blood covenant runs or rather ran from Adam and Eve all the way to the father of faith, Abraham. 
Do you know about something now? All to the Bible theologians are sitting here. Do you know there is no evidence in the Bible that Moses circumcised? There's no scripture that says that. But he was good to tell everybody else. Kena potong, you know you are potong. But he himself was not circumcised. Until this morning I found a scripture. Exodus chapter 4, verse 24. After getting this, the place of Egypt where with the Midianites, Moses was there for 40 years. He married a woman called Zipporah. And then now God says, you need to go back to Egypt. And I'm going to use you as a deliverer. He said yes and brought his wife, his family. He's, he's going. As he's going, the Bible says an angel of the Lord appeared to kill Moses. And very interesting, Zipporah did not meet God, you know. She's a daughter of a Midianite's priest. The father-in-law was a priest. But they also practiced blood sacrifice. This story from Adam and Eve came down. It became perverted over time. So people even did blood sacrifices to bring in demons. They knew somehow this is the channel. So people practiced that. And so the moment the angel of the Lord appeared to strike down Moses because this man was not circumcised and he was in really not a technical covenant with God, the angel came. You know what Zipporah is saying? Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. Now this is RA21. Why? The word Moses' feet is really not feet, feet, this lake. In the Hebrew, is Moses' genitals. The Hebrew scholars, in the original Bible, this was what it was written. But over time, as they translated the Bible, the Hebrew scholars felt that the word Moses is a, ma a man revered as a prophet of God. And they should not write in this way. So they put the word feet, like as though presenting. Yet in their footnotes in the Hebrew scholars' commentaries, it was written as genitals in the Hebrew, original Hebrew language. And this morning I found it. As I was just going through back into this study. What? Wow, so easy, yeah? She takes the blood of the foreskin of the sun and touches on Moses, considered that you are circumcised. Because there is no direct evidence that Moses was ever circumcised. Yet, God made a covenant with him in that way. When the moment the blood was applied, it was received. Now, this is a spiritual truth I want to tell you for all of us who want to serve God. You know, when you have an intervention with God, when you have a revelation with God, it's as though the revelation came when you were praying and worshipping in a church and, and someone gave a prophecy for you and all of that is great and whatever God spoke to you is waiting for you until you make a covenant of surrender with God. And that's the lesson we learned from Moses. Moses saw God for 40 days and 40 nights, but yet he has not made a covenant. The moment he came down, about to go to Egypt, the angel appeared and says, you are yet not in covenant with me. And the covenant must be made. And so the circumcision was done. My brothers and sisters, that is the secret why sometimes God can reveal you 101 things. Prophecies would have come and, and uh, God is going to use you this and God is going to bless that. But until your life is in covenant and in obedience, those prophecies will not come to pass. We become prophecy collectors. The other day someone called me in. Pastor, pray. Head or tail, don't know, you know. And this guy never met me before. Head or tail, don't know. Somehow they got the number. Pray. And not local, very far away, different country. Pray. Say, pray for what? No, no, no. You just pray. I say, I'm praying what? You pray anything. <laughs> I think I've told you enough times in this church, when you say pray anything, you finish. 
I'll say you'll eat a lot and grow fat. <laughs> Give me a word. I say, eat the Bible. Pray anything. I say, brother, who are you? Uh, okay, I'm not going to pray for you today. I don't feel well. I put down the phone. Overseas caller. No, the idea that I'm trying to tell them is, you don't treat God. See, when you're a child, listen, child of God. Are you a child of God? When you're a child of God, don't treat a prophet, no God, like a fortune teller. Don't say, I, want, I, I don't tell you anything, you, you just pray. That is those days we used to do those things. Now you are God's child. You are growing up. You are maturing. You don't operate like a fortune teller. When you, ah, you, come here. We used to do those things before. Now you are a child of God. The Bible says when you have a need, when you are sick, call on to your elders. When they pray, the word of the Lord will come. Do you see? You see the difference between how the community of faith operates in a different dynamics. We have not matured yet. Even in a, 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 in a, in a, in a conference, the prophet operates like an evangelist. He doesn't operate like a prophet. What, what does the prophet evangelist do? Give altar call, right? That's what the prophet does. Everybody you need, come, 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 come. And then prophesy over everyone. But prophets don't do that. Prophets have to pray the word of the Lord. They preach the word of the Lord. And the power of God will come over them. And they are set free while they are sitting. But people have not related to that level yet. They are still relating to altar call way of doing things. Why? If you read the history of God, God did different things during different times. So I learned from you, you learn from me, I learn from you, you learn from me, and it stopped there. The blood of Jesus. Oh, covenant. Then we thought, oh, after Moses, no story. After Moses, the story was on the doorpost. Remember Genesis chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 4? The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are and where I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plug will touch you when I struck Egypt. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. Today we are going to stop here. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. I don't know whether you paid attention or not. When you enter the doorway from the lift, we have a red color, uh, what do you call that? Uh? Curtain, uh? ribbon, uh? sarong, uh? no. A red color cloth, red color cloth that is hanging on the doorpost, which the Lord told us, as a sign of the blood covenant God has made with us, put a sign out there. And so that's why there is a kind of a red cloth hanging there. Uh, not, not auspicious color. Huh? That's why today blood, I so want to be auspicious, I wear it. <laughs> I want you to know, the blood of Jesus. When you plead the blood, the devil will leave. There is power in this blood. And that is why when we go to people's houses and pray, we plead the blood of Jesus. And when you go to a non-Christian house, they depend on signs and symbols. So we take a kind of a pot of water and pray and say, God, bless this water to become holy water. Make this water to become your blood symbolically in the spirit. You take this water and, and you sprinkle around. For your eyes is just water, but in the realm of the Spirit, the blood of Jesus is washing every wall away. I went to a house to pray. You know, sometimes because the Singapore is becoming so sensitive about race, religion and all that. You say anything or so, you cannot left and right. But you cannot hide the truth what God is doing. Amen. You can't hide the truth. So I went to a person's house to pray. And uh, this lady, young girl, was living in demon possession I'm telling you bite marks over her body scratch marks everywhere and once I had my uh, another counseling officer secretary to come and stand there and watch all over the the lower rib you can see scratch marks appearing how this demon appears in the night in the form of her uncle and molests her touches her scratches her, frightens her and she has been living that for 12 years. Every night. No one could help her. She went here, she went there. Finally, somehow she came to our meeting years ago and she came to the counseling and I was teaching her about the word of God and take hold of 
all of that and I say, Pastor, when I come to your office room, I feel the freedom as though someone is standing outside the moment I enter. But the moment I step out, this spirit is following back and it's always parking itself in the house. And when she sleeps, the, and so she's frightened of sleeping, and the scare, which was there, you can ask. It was so scary, huh? She has not slept in months, you know. She will look like a drug addict each time I look at her. Lack of sleep. The moment she closes eyes, the spirit will come and start molesting her again. I went to the house. The father was there, and he's from different religion, and I told about Jesus. And say, can I pray? Is it okay if I walk around the house? He said, okay, you walk. I went and prayed to different rooms. I took the water and I sp splash and I say, the blood of Jesus cleanses every room. The moment I came to this particular room, to this particular point where the cupboard was there, I said, this is where the Spirit is. There is something here that the Spirit is hiding. And the thing is, nobody has touched this cupboard. The cupboard belongs to the grandma. The grandma has passed away. It became so sacred. No one has touched. I said, the spirit is hiding here. If you want to be free, ask your mother, father or uh, father or mother to move and see what's inside. And they move and remove the window, I mean mirror that was attaching itself. Some it was loose and was shaking. They pull it out and out came a charm that was done by the uncle and the uncle molested this girl when she was a young girl and the uncle died and that was the charm that he wrote so that this girl will always fall for her and he died and the spirit came and a familiar spirit came to the house in the form of the uncle and every night was molesting this girl only God knows where charms are hidden, amen. I tell you, the greatest story of all, the greatest story of all. The charm was removed, I tore it up, I threw in the name of Jesus, cleansed every part of this uh, room and prayed for the uncle, he didn't say much. Few months later, the girl called me, they went to a Cantonese service. And the Father accepted Jesus as his personal Savior. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering. The stronghold that was holding not just this girl, no. The Father's mind was broken because the blood of Jesus. Oh, I may think, oh, this is a powerful man of God. It's a powerful blood of Jesus. When you apply the blood on the doorposts, I will command every evil to get out. Listen, my brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with a family member who's living in sin, who's living in a life which you know is contrary to the ways of God, if that's your house, you have this right to apply the blood of Jesus. You have that right. Each time I tell parents, and I'm going to tell you again, we got to respect privacy. But don't condone secrecy. Every demonic works grows in secrecy. Sometimes parents, the moment you're, you let your children stay in the room, it's as though the room is written off to them. You don't even step in. That step in is mine ground, bombing ground. The more you go in, you finish, you die. We pray over every area of the house except the children's room. Because you, oh, that's not my place, it's his. But it's your house. When you pray, when you release God's word, the blood of Jesus cleanses every part of the room. I wish I could tell you stories after stories how demons park themselves in different rooms. But time does not permit for us. The blood of Jesus still has the same power as it had the days of Adam and Eve. Amen? Next week we will discover how the Hebrews did covenants and what the Bible says and why Abraham did a covenant and God appeared to him, walked with him around the fire and from that day on, he became the father of faith. My brothers and sisters, I'm sure you have heard all the time, walk in obedience, walk in the spirit. I've said it many times as well. 
But one of the things I want to remind you for this year, 2014, open a new dimension in the realm of the Spirit. He says, open a new realm. And so I encourage you as your brother in the Lord, walk in your covenant. That's going to empower you in this season as we are living for the Lord. Amen? We're going to pray. Can we just stand up together for a few moments? After which I have a, a very quick announcement. Can you very quickly for a few moments, you know, put your heart with the Lord. Think about the blood of Jesus. Think about the blood of Jesus. Father, can I encourage you to plead the blood of the Lamb over yourself, over your loved ones? Plead the blood of Jesus into your place that you stay. Plead the blood of Jesus in all the property that you have. You just say, Lord, I, I plead the blood of the Lamb on my properties. For those of us who are driving and those of us got bikes and, and even, you know, uh, all the young guys and girls who've got bicycles and stuff that you travel with, plead the blood of Jesus over all your vehicles that the enemy has got no power to touch you, know your properties. Plead the blood of Jesus over your business, over your work. The, the enemy has got no power to touch the enemy has got no power to touch your bread and butter because the blood of Jesus is over you. And I declare in Jesus' name as the head of this church below the headship of Jesus Christ I plead the blood of Jesus on everyone who is here in the house of God this morning and those of them who are not able to be here, as long as you are part of this fellowship, I plead the blood of Jesus over you. Over your families. Over all the things that you do with your hand. That God will sanctify it, cleanse it, wash it by the blood of Christ. The Bible says, Noah walked with God habitually, that God took him away. By my brothers and sisters, Noah depended of the blood. Abraham spoke with God, but he depended on the blood. Moses saw God, but he depended on the blood. How much more you and I need to depend on the blood of Jesus Christ. It is time that we walk in God's covenant. It is time to take your position in where God has placed you and what God has asked you to do. So Father, I want to thank you. I pray for God's protection, health and healing, grace and all the good things that you have promised for your children in the name of Jesus, Lord. And I want to thank you, Father, that your goodness will continue to prevail in each one of their lives. Father, I want to thank you even for those of you who have uh, animals, uh, in your house, we also pray for God's protection over them. I pray the seven blessings over everybody who is here. I want to thank you that the blood of Jesus has removed curses, cleansed our hearts. It has brought life. It has brought blessings and prosperity. It has brought life and balance. It has brought longevity. And it brought eternity in Jesus' name. I want to thank you, Father. That your hand will continue to lead us forward. May God's goodness continue to bless us. I pray for the love of the Father. And the fellowship of dear Son Jesus Christ. The communion of the Holy Spirit. To be upon each one of us and our children. Today, tomorrow and forevermore. May the hand of God be experienced throughout the week until we meet again in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a clap of praise. Bless you. Take a seat for a few moments. I just need about two minutes just to give you a very quick announcement.